This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. I am super excited about this week's Masters in Business Live with Vanguard Group CEO Tim Buckley. If you recall pre-pandemic, we had started doing these live events. The first one was uh, with Ray Dalio, and then we did one with Howard Marks, and then everything closed down, and we kind of put it on hiatus. Well, they're back. Masters in Business Live is back, and this one with the CEO of uh, the Vanguard Group was really quite wonderful. It was at the big ETF exchange conference in Miami that was held last weekend. I got to sit with uh, Tim for about an hour uh, and ran through about 45 minutes worth of questions, and we took some questions from the audience. If you remember about five years ago when it was announced that he was going to be CEO, we did 10 questions with Tim Buckley, and I'll link to that in the description of the podcast. This completes my set. I have now interviewed all four Vanguard CEOs for Masters in Business, Jack Bogle, Jack Brennan, Bill McNabb, and now Tim Buckley. Really quite a fascinating conversation, a tour de force. Uh, with no further ado, my Masters in Business live discussion with the Vanguard Group CEO, Tim Buckley. So let's talk a little bit about what we have going on right now. You've been at Vanguard for over 30 years. Yep. You've been CEO for five years. How's it going? It's been a, uh, it's been a learning time, mm -hmm. and it's been a, uh, a growth time, is, is what, I what I would say, Barry. It's been um, you know, an incredible opportunity, if you think about what Vanguard's all about. Um, we sit there each and every day figuring out how do we help people retire better? put their kids through college, um, afford that dream home. And they've been, a, I think everyone in the audience agree, it's been, a, it's been a tough few years for investors. And that's a time to rally. And certainly for us, that has been a time to show up and answer the bell for our clients. And so it's, it's a, been a rewarding time. It might seem odd to say that, but a really rewarding time. So let's talk a little bit about your unusual career path. You come out of Harvard undergraduate, and you essentially get a job as like a gopher for Jack Bogle. You're his. Yeah. Well, it, it, they, it was lackey to the lackey. Um, is really the, he had. So you weren't uh, even working for Jack. You're working no, for Jack's guy. Well, I was supposed to be working for him, but I really was working for Jim Norris, who was his his assistant. We worked together for Jack Bogle. I reported to Jack Bogle. Um, I found out later I had the title of chairman's intern, <laughs> and. Uh, I found out I had that title because they weren't sure I was going to make it through the summer. Mm -hmm. So I come out of undergrad as chairman's intern. I thought that was my title for good. After the summer, they changed it. I found out, well, if you made it. Oh, you um, have a job. You have a job. I didn't know what was going to happen if the intern part didn't work out. Um, but it's a uh, finding, finding Vanguard. I was, I was lucky to find Vanguard. Um, Why? Well, coming out of school and I look I have a my oldest is, is, a, is a junior in school now so I'm sure he'll face this but I was the, the typical senior and I was a little lost coming out of school mm -hmm. um, I'm the son of a heart surgeon mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up with someone who had a ton of purpose in his life I mean very like saving lives on a daily basis that gives you a little bit of purpose right and I was lost and he um, I wasn't going to go into medicine like I didn't have the steady hands for it and uh, I didn't have the stomach for hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I love business, I love the markets, I wanted to go that way, but I was struggling. I, I, was, I was trying to find a, a place with the same type of purpose. And, um, and I was thinking maybe I need to go back into medicine. My father said to me at that time, save lives or help people live better lives, anything else, and you're wasting your time. And no he pressure. Said, no, you, you, but he said, you don't need to go into medicine for that. And then he actually suggested I go talk to this company, Vanguard. Really? That was your yeah. father's suggestion? He said, hey, reach out to Vanguard. And, and uh, I was fortunate enough to come down and interview at Vanguard and look, love at first sight. I mean, it was a company owned by its clients with a, a clear purpose um, to really give them a fair shake and, and provide them with a better future. And 32, late, 32 years later, here we sit. What was it like working for Jack Bogle right out of school? I mean, that had to be a little 
clearly Vanguard wasn't the Vanguard we know today 30 years ago, but it had to be a little intimidating. Well, maybe I should have said I was both lost and a little clueless. I mean, remember, this is 1991. You're coming out. This is pre-internet. I mean, Vanguard's really no one knows who Vanguard is. Mm -hmm. um, so my friends, they thought Vanguard was an airline. Um, it, which it was. A second, yeah, a second guess would have been a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I used to have to describe it as, as uh, the Pennsylvania version of our Boston competitor. So, um, and uh, so... I, people didn't know Vanguard wasn't the firm it is today. And then Jack Bogle, like he wasn't the household name. So I didn't show up intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, I showed up curious. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, I asked a ton of questions. And he's a guy that, look, wanted to teach a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you were willing to listen, you'd learn a lot. So Bill McNabb uh, was the CEO during the financial crisis. And when I spoke with him, he talked about how that created both challenges and opportunities for Vanguard. You're the CEO during the pandemic, COVID lockdown. What sort of challenges? A couple of bear markets. Yeah. We hit, right? like, uh, let's see, uh, inflation at a 40-year high, tightest labor, uh, tightest labor market of our lifetimes. But yeah, other than that, it's been easy, easy times. So, so what sort of challenges and opportunities have the past five years presented? I think there's one of a, a huge, a huge lesson for us, and it's brought out in our, our leadership team. That great leaders, you've got to embrace your reality. You can't be an optimist or a, a pessimist. You just have to embrace the facts in front of you, brutal as they may be. And that's what we learn throughout this. And you have to plot the best path forward. And maybe if you humor me, we'll go back to kind of the first time we talked and you go back to that time because Vanguard had been gone through a, a decade of, of incredible success, great growth. And look, our fund performance had been top notch. If you went back to that time and you know, our net promoter scores were really high, um, cash flow outpacing the industry. So all signs were great. We had a wonderful opportunity in front of us. We looked at, um, we looked at, at a client success, we saw it as, hey, it was defined by the funds they hold, but also by the advice they got on those funds. And for 40 years, like, we had been hammering, hammering away at the fund side of that. We had lowered the cost of investing, and we had improved the quality of those funds, and, you know, dare I say, we made a, a, a change in the industry. Well, we started to think that maybe we could actually do that on the advice side. Maybe we could be the vanguard of advice, because we had this, this PAS group that personal advisor services that had some early success. So we sat on and said, okay, like, could we build another engine of value? Engine one being the funds and engine two being advice. And if we could do that, that'd be wonderful. So right before doing that, right after we talked, we looked at, uh, we have like looking at our competitive position. Do it constantly and we call it, hey, let's embrace the brutal facts. We looked at the foundation of, of our position and it, it wasn't as good as we thought it was. In, in fact, it, we're a low-cost leader, but at that time, we weren't. If you looked at our ETF assets, um, at that time, less than half of them were actually would have been considered lowest cost in the industry. Our NPS scores were high, but they were declining um, because of an antiquated digital experience. We were losing market share in the critical retirement, the 401k business. Um, internationally, we were spread too thin. We were serving clients, that institutional clients. And, that weren't core to who we are. We're all about the individual investor. So we looked at those and said, well, we've got to address those and we want to build this new engine of value with advice. Great, awesome, that seemed like enough. And then COVID hit. We had a choice to make at that point. And the choice was, do we just delay everything and play defense? Or do we just add a pandemic to our list of brutal facts? We chose the latter and said, this is, we have no idea how long this is going to go on, but we owe it to our clients to emerge from it stronger and better than when we went in. And we had to, we prioritized all our strategic plans. We had to figure out how to get them done while people were, were remote. Forced us to make some tough choices in, 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 in that time and some big investments, whether we were building out our advice capabilities and building virtual teams to do it, or, you know, tough choices in, our retirement business, we had to rebuild it soup to nuts. And we partnered with Infosys, but that meant 1,300 crew went and worked for Infosys. But it meant we could triple the resources um, that we had you know, focused on our retirement business. 
We looked in our, our personal investor, our direct business, and said, we have to organize it differently and we have to modernize that digital experience. And a tough decision uh, overseas. I basically pulled back from Asia. It was all institutional clients. And we gave back uh, $125 billion in assets, which most people think is crazy. Billion with a B. $125 billion. Wow. They were all institutional separate accounts. That's, that's not what we do here. And gave it back to them. And I'm, that's not, not where we'll excel. And you know, it's just not what makes us tick. A little a tangent here. Like we were managing money for people for basis point and a half. And then they were going ahead and charging 70 basis points. Like, that's not why we get out of bed, right? We want to see that an investor have a better return as a result. So made those tough choices, and, and uh, you know, five years later, we're sitting a lot better off. Whatever you identified as a structural fault line, how far along do you feel you are in the process of, hey, we want to, we're here, we want to end up there. Uh, are you halfway there, most of the way there? How, how do you think I, about we, we talk about just getting started. But, you know, it's one of those things that as a leader, you don't think about, like, well, here's the finish line and then I'm done. It's how far can you push it and get the next team ready to take over and continue that journey. Um, but for us, you know, we, we measure our success in different ways. We measure our success by how are our funds doing. And we look back long-term performance. And right now you look back over 10 years and our active funds, 94% of them are outperforming their competitive group averages. 68% are outperforming their, their benchmarks. If you look at that ETF low-cost leadership space, um, I believe 86% of our assets would now be considered lowest cost. So we can actually have that low-cost title back, if you will. Um, if you, if you kind of continue on to that advice journey that we had. Uh, for us, it was just, thankful. last time we talked, we had about 80 billion in advised assets. Mm -hmm. That sits at about 350 billion. Out of 7.2 trillion? Out of 7.2 trillion, but it's growing at 15 to 20% a year. Um, and there, there are 650,000 clients that at the bottom of the market last year, 80% of them were still right on target with their goals. Mm -hmm. And for advice for us, too, is also a matter of, you think about advisors. How are we using model portfolios to make their result, results better? Um, are we making sure that they have the, the right products from Vanguard to actually complement what they do, the right practices? Being in the advice business ourselves, we can help improve their practices, justify the advice that they give, um, justify the, the fee, and you know, just simple things like, hey, the value of tax loss harvesting. How do you make that, that apparent to people? Um, something that for us saved our clients about 300 million in four months, that alone. And uh, our digital experience, you asked about that. That one, I, I can tell you how far along we are in, in, in modernizing that. We're about 75% of the way mm -hmm. in doing that. And so, great change. So, so you mentioned the pandemic was a, a, a little bit of a challenge. Everybody is working remote for a long time. How do you maintain corporate culture with 20,000, 18,000 employees when the vast majority of them are not coming into the office. It, I think it's, a, it's tough for every company out there. Um, when you've hired thousands of people who have never f set foot on a campus and you often model the behavior and a culture. Um, and so the first thing for us is it's, it's, how, it's in the leaders that you, you actually select. And that's so crucial for us. So in our screening, you get odd interview questions. We're trying to figure out, are you purpose driven? Like, are you actually someone who's going to be purpose-driven? But then we have a, something that I learned from one of my mentors. You've talked with Jack Brennan before, a former chairman and CEO. Um, and he always established this early on in the culture, that it would be client, crew, self, always in that order. And a lot of companies will say that, like he will put the client first. But I, we don't have another choice. Like, our clients own us. We don't have anyone else to serve. And then during the pandemic, it became clear to us, like, yeah, but the only way we can mess that up is if people start putting themselves in front of the client. And so the leaders there, we have to say, okay, we have to enforce it. It's always the client first. And as a leader, then, that means that you have to take care of the crew before yourself. So we emphasize that wholly, that leaders are going to actually make sure that crew know that they care more about their success than their own. So for me, it's, it's more important to see my team's success than Tim Buckley's success. And it's amazing how that helps build a team if you're true behind it, and it builds the collaboration on that team. And then down the road is somewhere where you put yourself, but that is a core to our culture. We're able to do it in a virtual world, but now that people are basically back for three days a week, it's a lot easier to reinforce it um, and people to see it when they're actually face to face. 
So back three days a week, um, home optional two days a week, how does that structure change what you expect people to do when they actually come to the office? Yeah, so I'm sure a lot of people have been through this where they come into the office, and we had it at first where people came into the office and they were on Teams when they were in the office. So what we were doing, finding doing is, Zoom yeah, calls, we were yeah. finding like, okay, they're, they come into the office, they say hello to each other, and they sit down at their desk and they go on video all day long. Well, that defeats the purpose of actually those serendipitous moments where you're bumping into each other, trading ideas, you're sitting in a conference room, you're talking to each other, building on everyone's points if you're on Teams. So we said, why is that? Well, it was because not everyone was coming in. And you still had some people at home and some people, or you didn't want to travel from building to building. We have a nice campus and not everyone wanted to travel. And we just said, no, actually, when you're here, like first, everyone's got to be here. And then secondly, when you're here, we expect you to actually interact with each other, not on Teams. And you, know, you, you want to see that, that Teams usage drop in the middle of the week and go up on the tail ends because Monday and Friday are the virtual days. So we actually had to establish that norm that people had gotten so used to using Teams all the time in the middle of the week. We had to move people away from it. So let's stick with the leadership theme. And you come to the CEO role with a unique leadership background, you used to describe yourself as CIO squared. You were chief investment officer and chief information officer, an unusual combination, and then to be elevated in CEO. How does that background affect how you think about the role of chief executive officer? Yeah, I think for every CEO, you need perspective. And I think both the CIO jobs gave me incredible perspective. The first one would have been back in uh, you think about, I became CIO at, right at the tail end of the internet craze. I was on the web and then took over as uh, chief information officer. And that was a, a time of incredible hype, right? The internet's going to change the world. Oh my gosh, it'll change how we actually consume you know, video, how we game, how we do business. And everyone was talking about that in 99, 2000. You remember that well. And then it didn't happen right away and everyone ended up disappointed. We know what happened over the long run. It reminded, it, it, you know, back then we, we used to talk about something that I've tried to bring back for people, which is that, that Gartner hype cycle, if mm -hmm. you remember it. And that Gartner hype cycle was something where whenever there's a disruptive technology and it comes in, there's a lot, there's a lot of hype and high expectations. So unrealistic expectations, followed by something doesn't happen, you have disillusionment. You have the trough of disillusionment. And people give up on it. But the true change comes when, hey, you know what? Those loyal to that technological change figure out over not one, two, but three, five years how to drive change and how to leverage it. And that's been true through time. It was true whether it's with the internet, you can plot it with mapping the genome, with EVs. And it's true in investments. Right? You have to look at a change and you know, people will talk today about, okay, a private equity, some magic elixir. If I can just get private equity into my clients' portfolios, it's, it's not true. I mean, private equity, the, there's greater re return dispersion, but the returns on private equity are often below the S&P 500 on average. So you've got to do your work. You've got to see through it and say, okay, well, that means that I need to keep fees low and I have to get with the right GPs, et cetera. And so you can drive, you can figure out where's that long-term change going. So those two jobs give you a perspective for, okay, avoid that hype and how do you see through the long-term change that you want, that you think should, you should drive home? Um, they're probably different in how you embrace change. In IT, the world's always changing, mm -hmm. right? So that's a dangerous thing, like how people code, where you host, where you host something, all of those things, those have, you know, how applications talk to each other, those have to totally changed since I was CIO. And, um, but if you think in investments, certain things, like there are more rules in there. Like, that proven investment philosophy of diversification, that's not gonna change overnight. So you have to be more careful in the investment world and hey, both of those give me a balance as CEO. So Vanguard now has a hardcore tech geek as CEO. How has that affected the company? How has that affected how you approach the use of technology in the world of investing? Yeah, look, uh, thanks for calling me a tech geek. I'll take that as a compliment. Um, that's how it's meant. Yeah. Um, for us, it's technology is the embodiment of our service. We're, we've always been a virtual company. It just used to be through the mail and, and one in hundred number when I joined. So um, it's always been that way for us. So it needs to be a necessary area of investment. 
And I mentioned this, with, when you lead with technology, what can happen to you is you can, if you don't continually make the investment, you fall behind. Because it gets so costly to address your legacy. It becomes an albatross, your, kind of your legacy applications. They become uh, a burden and they slow you down and they slow down what you can do for your clients. We, we made the choice of, you know, well, we're going to eliminate that legacy. And a few years ago, we said on whether you're investing directly, whether you're investing through an advisor, whether you're investing through a retirement plan, the platforms that we deal with, our service infrastructure, our investment infrastructure, cloud native. So we've rebuilt, we're about 74% of the way through of rebuilding all our applications to be cloud native. Now, that sounds cool, like what does it give you? It builds up your, uh, your resiliency, but your speed. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll give you an example. Um, maybe the team won't love that I'll use this one, but we, we launched a, a mobile app last year. Mm -hmm. right? and, um, it, was, uh, it fell flat on its face, the mobile app. Like, it was panned. Our clients hated the mobile app. And in the past, when you did that, well, you had to live with it. Like, you'd have to wait for nine months to fix the, the problem. But because it was built cloud native, that meant you could make changes to it. You could make the changes every two, three days. Mm -hmm. And so we did 200 releases to it in nine months, and that app like, has gone way past the, the satisfaction ratings, client satisfaction ratings of the past one, and continues to grow. And so being cloud native can give you incredible speed. Resiliency last year, our availability, and you never get a good art article written when you have high availability, you just want to avoid the bad ones. Mm -hmm. We were 99.97% available for our client application. So um, that's a number I hadn't seen before. So let's talk a little bit about fees. The Vanguard effect has been well documented. Not just the spaces that you're in force everybody else to be more fee competitive, but even spaces you first start looking at immediately has a ripple effect and fees drop. How much lower can Vanguard push fees? Uh, half of my portfolio is at three bips. Oh, how about two? Okay, but aren't you gonna run out of room eventually? Well, the, the way we're, we're built is it's the way we, being client owned, it's the way we return profits to our clients. That's so the dividend. That's the dividend that we pay out is to, to lower that expense ratio. And it's, it's how we're built and it comes with the, those are economies of scale. Um, every year, just like any other company, we have our expenses that includes kind of the big investments we're making in the business and we have our revenue line. And we end up, you know, we've had been lucky to be very profitable year after year. Well, what do you do with that? You can, number one, you'll put it back into the business. There's plenty of capital to put back into the business if it, with projects that will meet your cost of capital. So you do that. You have to make sure you have enough liquidity reserves to, so if, you, if there's a big bear market, you want to protect your investments, et cetera, risk event. But then other companies will retain earnings. They'll pay a dividend, or go to a family. What we do is you say, okay, with, that, with the, uh, that capital, we'll give it back to our clients in the form of lower expenses. And it's been a pretty powerful cycle, and that's why year after year we'll, we're able to kind of lower expense ratio. So a guy, um, I mentioned Jack Brennan, I bumped into him in the, in the hall the other day. He, was, um, he stepped down as, as CEO in 2008. And he said, Tim, when I joined Vanguard, our expense ratio was 88 basis points. 88? 88, and it's you know, less than a tenth of that now. Wow, that, that's pretty impressive. There's so not many industries where you actually get more and pay dramatically less. And this has been the history of the firm from day one. This is a core of Jack Bogle's philosophy. Um, a lot of people think it's all about passive, but Jack began as an active manager. You're now about 20% active at Vanguard. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing on the active side of asset management. It's a funny fact of being there 32 years. I joined Vanguard and um, index was only 10% of our assets. You were 90% active. Yeah, 90% active. So we were an active firm um, right. when, when, I, when I joined Vanguard. Um, and it's just, it's evolved over time to be 80% to be 80, 80 index. We firmly believe in active. We firmly believe in low cost active, but it, its place in the portfolio has changed. Mm -hmm. If you think about uh, port for most clients, it's an index at the core. And if you're going to, if you have the, the, the risk appetite for active, it's going to play much more of a satellite. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as we look at it, we, we look towards strategies it might have 
well, maybe it's the same, a little bit higher, you'd hope for information ratio, but you have a, a bigger risk budget or standard deviation, so you look for more excess, excess return. So that plays for a better complement to the index portfolio. Now, how do we think about active managers? People will talk about, well, yeah, it's people, it's philosophy and process, and you'll go through all of those. But we found the best way to evaluate one is make sure that they can tell you what their edge is. What is their active edge? And it has to be one that can't be easily duplicated in the market. Because in a zero-sum game, right, where you're competing with other managers, you want one an edge that nobody else has. So you can't just say we have smart people and they collaborate well with technology, right? Everybody's got smart people and everyone's got great technology. You can't just say, you know what, we think differently. We want you to prove it. So how do you think differently? So you've talked with the leaders at Bailey Gifford. Mm -hmm. like, where do they hire from? Well, they don't hire from business schools, right? They'll hire military intelligence officers and have them work actually, I'm serious, with a poet and with someone else. And they keep them in pods of teams that they work together, but they don't collaborate. They don't want group thinks. So they don't let them with, work with other groups. And then you measure, do they truly keep that edge of differentiated thinking? We do it to ourselves, our active fixed income group against super smart people supported by great technology, but what's there? What's that edge that no one else could duplicate in there? It comes from our structure. If you think about the fact that we have, a, a, like we're client owned, so we're delivering as close to at cost as possible, we're gonna be a lower fee than, than almost everybody out there. That means a low hurdle rate. So what do you do with that? Well, for us, that means that, hey, when you're not getting paid to take risk, when spreads are tight, like right now, then don't take a lot. You don't have to. Right? You don't have to make, you don't have to take that extra spread or go out and credit quality and take extra risk there because, look, you have a low expense ratio. It can be higher quality and you'll equal or maybe you fall behind just a little bit and you'll keep a lot of dry powder. And so then when you have spreads wide now, you have you know, dislocations in the marketplace, you have plenty of dry powder and you deploy it. And with that strategy, you will outperform over the long run. And I mentioned that 10-year performance. If you look at our active fixed income, I believe 98% of the funds have outperformed their competition over the long run. So their competitive group averages. So it's a, and straight up the number's huge. So it's a, it's a differentiated way, but we measure it. Like, do they truly deploy that black powder? Do they, that dry powder? Do they take advantage of it? So you mentioned Bailey Gifford. I bet a lot of people here in the States don't know them. Uh, been around for a century in the UK, if not longer, highly regarded, great track record. I want to put that in context of leadership. You're reaching out to, I guess, not a competitor, but a peer, saying, how can we get better? How often does that occur? What sort of strategies do you put into place? How often are you saying, hey, let's uh, sit down and talk shop? With our outside managers or with outside firms? With, you know, Bailey Gifford is a great entity. They, I yeah, think I they, mean, were, they were managing money for uh, one of the public pensions for... Yeah, so we have, we have a team um, who are constantly out there looking for who could be great outside managers. And they will look for that active edge, they'll look for that differentiation, and they're constantly out there so that if there's an opportunity that pops up in a fund or there's an idea for a fund, that we actually have a list that we can go to right off of people that we respect and that we could work with. And that working with Vanguard, you know, one of the, they'll say one of the differentiators is that we're so long-term. They have such a long-term focus that they truly can have a low turnover and stick with an idea, not worry, hey, they're underperforming for two years that like we're going to move on from them. So we're probably a lot more patient. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, highly educated in, how the, in the questions we ask. So you joined the leadership team in 2001, which is, you know, All a right, decade. we're going back now. Yeah, yeah, a decade into your career. That's a pretty fast advancement. I assume you were relatively young compared to the rest of the leadership team. How do you get from that entry to senior management what was the career path like from there? Yeah, I, w I was young and over my head. Uh, really? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I was. I had been running the web, and that was that was enough for me. Um, I, you know, unfortunately back then our our CIO uh, suddenly passed away, and Jack Brennan asked me to step in and lead our technology group. Um, it was a surprise choice for 
everyone, uh, it was a surprise for me. And I remember talking to him about it, going, pushing back a little bit, like, you know, look, I don't have the IT background that other people would have. And he said to me, uh, Tim, I'm not asking you to code, I'm asking you to lead. And then he went through the competencies that he would expect me to bring to the table and how I could bring our IT division to the next level. That stuck with me. A couple things stuck with me. It was the, the importance of competencies and, and developing those competencies in people and the importance of taking risk in the development of people. Another thing occurred to me probably a year later, and that was that um, and we're big believers in doing three, 360s on people. So getting feedback, every leader should go out and get feedback, not just from their boss, but from their peers and those people on their teams. So I did a 360. And you know, it always starts off with your, your strengths and where, where you're doing well and say like, oh gosh, you know, Tim's strategic and he's got, he's got drive and he gets the results and collaborative and loving everything. Then I get down to the, okay, here's what his weakness is, where he needs to work. And you know, the bottom was patience and we can come back to that some other time. Right, you don't um, have the patience to yeah, talk about that. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, still a weakness. Um, but second from the bottom was developing talent. Man, that one stung because I realized you know, I had been a taker all this time, not, this, not a giver. And, and, and you had been mentored by oh, Jack gosh, Brennan, yeah. right? Okay. By Jack Brennan and Bill McNabb and, and Mike Miller and you know, all these people through time who had taken an interest in my career. And they took an interest in my career. And when people asked about me, I hadn't done as much. Now, there might have been one or two people that said I was the best thing to happen in their career, but... Um, by and large, I hadn't done enough. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent the next you know, 22 years saying, okay, well, how do I develop talent? And I would tell you that for me, um, my proudest moments at Vanguard are when someone that I've mentored ends up on our, on our senior leadership team. And uh, fully half of that team, I can say I had, had a hand in, in mentoring them along. So it takes concerted effort. And, and for a leader, it's, it's nothing more rewarding because that's your, that's the way you have exponential impact. If you can pass on your lessons and someone else builds on them and they teach them to somebody else, that's, that's where a leader can have true impact. How does a company the size of Vanguard institutionalize that sort of mentoring, leadership, grooming, um, bringing up the next generation, getting people to reach outside their comfort zone and become better colleagues, workers, and eventually leaders? It, at, every, at every leadership level, um, we do talent oversight where we'll go through and you, you should know your teams. And you'll know your leader, you'll, everyone will know their leadership team, people in their group, where they're strong in their competencies, where they need to develop. And we will talk about, we constantly rotate talent to develop them. And rotate. Rotate. How do you so, rotate talent? You, well, look, I mean, the same way that I was rotated between you know, what would be a corporate area to a, a service area to an IT area, to investments. And you wrote, you give up your best talent. And it's odd. Most companies don't do it. You, you want to hold on to your best talent. But at Vanguard, you're rewarded for give up your best talent and make sure they develop. And how do you develop them? And we do it. We rotate people based off of their competencies. We know, think of them buck, as buckets that you need to fill. And it may be, okay, well, what's someone's you know, vision and, and strategic thinking. And it might be how well they know operations management, how good are they developing crew? And these are buckets that you're, you're trying to fill along the way. And you can't fill them all in one job and, or with one boss. Some bosses will be better than others. So what we do is if we understand those about our people, then we rotate and we know what the next one or two or three rotations will be. And we do it around their competencies. As we rotate them, there's a big, there's a give up someone loses their, their expertise in a role. So, oh, how do you? But what they're gaining is context. They're gaining context and becoming a better leader, better decision maker. You just have to, it's a system you have to balance because you can't have everyone rotate to a new, new area. You have to keep institutional knowledge and really sandwich people, like experience on the top, experience on the bottom, and kind of someone fresh in the middle. So you mentioned Bill McNabb, who was your predecessor, as well as Jack Brennan, his predecessor. Yeah. Those, those are two rock star finance CEOs. What's it like for you as a CEO still having access 
to their expertise and experience. You, you said you just bumped into Brennan. Yeah. And Always. But, tell us a little bit about how you use the legacy former CEOs who are still around. And how cool it is. I mean, what, I mean, two very different leaders and um, two fabulous mentors and, and great friends, um, both of them. And they have a different way to, to see the world and see leadership. And I would encourage everyone out there that often people come into a role, they go, oh, I got to put my imprimatur on there. I can't talk to the past leaders. And look, these, um, whenever I, we make a big decision at Vanguard, and I, I talked about some of them, I would actually talk to Bill and talk to Jack first. I would understand, you know, why didn't we make this decision before? How did we get to this point? And they would give me the historical context and often give you information that, oh, I didn't think about that. And you might adjust, you might not. And they are accessible. Um, they made us leave our phones backstage, but I could text right now. You got yours? I could, I could text Bill right now and he'd get back to me in five minutes. Um, but neither of them will ever reach out to me and really? give me unsolicited advice. They're not they like, haven't. hey, Tim, what are you doing? The, oh, this is a I mean, mistake this is, this is one way. If I reach out to them, they get back to me, mm -hmm. but they don't reach out and go, hey, what are you thinking about? What did you do that for? Mm -hmm. And um, no, it's... Uh, it's, gr it's great, and you know, I, I mentioned that, um, that tough decision where the retirement business, both of them said, hey, we should have done that earlier. Really? And so it's reinforcing to have that, um, and we're lucky, and, and they're, they're proud that hey, we just became in that business number one in competitive NPS. So that business is, is totally shifted and turned around, um, but they were 100% behind it. Hmm. Let's, let's go back one more CEO to Jack Bogle, Obviously, he might have given me some unsolicited advice. Well, I was going to say for sure, he never was shy about sharing his opinion. And clearly, a lot of his philosophy is in the DNA of Vanguard put the client first, keep costs as low as possible, always try and make the investor better. But when we look at Vanguard today, there's a lot of things that Jack would have kicked and screamed about. ETFs, to begin with, he was not a big fan. Why do we have to invest overseas? American companies participate in that. And then lastly, the possibility of putting private equity in retirement accounts. He would be furious, I would imagine. Hey, he pushed about back that. on me on the web and would have good debates on that. And I think you, his vision, though, that's what was so powerful. And that's what remains, this, this idea of, of putting the client first and giving them a fair shake. That's what, you know, that's what defines us. People want to define us as a low-cost index fund, um, which Jack Bogle should be and was incredibly proud of. I mean, he brought this, this idea that existed out there and brought it mainstream. And uh, you know, so many people have done something to, so much to extend that. But he was the visionary behind indexing for the Main Street investor. And so we want to remember that, but that's not all he was. He was that vision of how do you put the client first? How do you let them keep more of their return? So we look, what are other ways to do it? Because it started with low cost active, but how do you do it through advice? You know, how do you do it directly advising clients? How do you help advisors become better at what they're doing so people can keep more of their return? They have a better chance of, of, of raising the investment sex, success of their clients. So that's how we define what we do. Private equity is just one of those. That in private equity, look, I said it's not an easy game. Like there is the, the first, the average return is typically a little bit below the S&P, and there's a wide dispersion of returns. So if we're going into that, how do we make sure that our clients are on the right side of that distribution? And you know, relative fees matter in there, access matters, and we had to vet all of those. That's very consistent with the original vision of Vanguard. Hmm. So let me throw a quote of yours back at you and, and let you this could be um, dangerous. pursue this. Quote, our clients should not only expect change, but demand change. Explain that. Well, there are our owners, um, and you never want to be complacent as a business. So as our owners, they, they should actually demand that we get better and better. And the other one is that if a company wants to lead, if, if you want to lead, you don't get to set the pace that you go at. Now, most people would think that, okay, if you're the lead, you're the one setting the pace of the race. But the truth of the matter, no, it's, it's, it's set by like, the performance of your competitors. You have to stay ahead of them and the expectations of your clients. If our clients have high expectations, we will keep our pace high. 
And we have to exceed both of those year after year. And so we have, always have to make sure we have the team, the plan, and the capabilities to do just that. So before we take questions from the audience, let me ask you, you've been at Vanguard for 32 years. You've been CEO for just over five years. What's next? What comes next for the Vanguard group? Hey Barry, it's a, what everyone could expect from us is to continue what we find a straightforward but compelling strategy. And it's to make sure we're perform, uh, producing the top performing funds that we have the top performing funds and ETFs out there, we'll wrap them with low cost, scalable advice and deliver them on a world class digitally enabled platform. Now it sounds simple to do, but you gotta bring those all together and if you do that well and you can keep improving it, you'll create value into the future. So let's, let's good answer, let's uh, go to some of the audience questions. The finance industry's record on diversity is not so great, what is Vanguard doing to lead the industry to faster change? It's one of those ones we've put a, a first you've got to have a, a big goal out there. So for us, it's, we'll continue to grow the diversity of Vanguard, but by 2028, we'll put the goal out there that um, every level of leadership should look just like the rest of, of Vanguard. And so we looked at it and said that is a goal that is attainable, but you need to have a distinct strategy around it. So we, uh, we have, a chief diversity officer that works with all of our uh, division heads to make sure that we have the, the right strategy, the right practices around how we do you know, attraction and retention, but critically development. You bring people in, you've worked hard recruiting, but you're making sure they're developing in the way that we talked about. And uh, the success for, success for us in the past five years, we've seen you know, both our diversity and our leadership go up six percentage points. So I like this question. What's one of the biggest lessons you learned in how to develop that talent? You've, you've, you've got to figure out how to be candid. Um, and you've got to, people shy from giving people feedback. And it's, it's everyone wants it. Um, it never feels good, so you have to figure out how will someone receive that feedback. And you've got to make it about getting them to the next level. And if I can, uh, you can give feedback to any, anybody if they believe you're on, you're on their side. And so how do you put it in a way that they're gonna say, okay, well, this is to help you get to the next level. One of my observations is, or how can we work on that? And that is a great way to get someone to receive feedback. And then my advice to other people, if you wanna develop yourself, something I've always done is I ask for feedback. And gosh, that makes it so much easier on a boss. And I used to, like poor Bill McNabb would do a review and say, hey, great year to me. Like, all right, tell me what I need to do better. Now tell me, like, what would the team say? And I would stay after him until he gave me something to grow on. Mm -hmm. And at any level, like, I, I don't care what level you're at, you should have two or three things you can grow on. And you're asking for feedback even as CEO? I ask for feedback and I make sure my team, even if Greg Davis, could you have a more accomplished CIO, Greg Davis is gonna hear where he's great, but he's also gonna say, Greg, your next level leadership, here's what you would work on. And so it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be that for him or for Karen Risi or, or for whomever's on the team. What was your biggest career mistake and what did you learn from it? Ooh, which one do we want to choose here? I would say that um, <laughs> it's, I got a few of them, but uh, let's go with conviction. A lesson here that um, I'll go back in time that, you know, I mentioned that, that hype and I was the web guy and I, uh, I was convinced the world was going to change overnight and online advice was going to take off and aggregation would be a key element of it. And I was selling hard. And we invested a lot of money in it, and nothing happened. Right? And uh, I remember talking to my boss at the time. He said, oh, I knew that wasn't going to work out. <laughs> and I said, well, like, Jack, well, why didn't you say something or do something? And uh, he said, Tim, you, know, you had to learn that just having conviction doesn't make it true. It, it, it's not enough. It's not enough. And, um, but I also learned all those things that I had conviction about. Like, there's another lesson there is over time you stay with it. Like, Look, digital advice is accepted now. And those things, so you also, you have to be, you have to, just because it didn't work doesn't mean you leave it behind. You know, when we were talking about uh, the things Jack Bogle wouldn't have loved, I meant to ask you about direct indexing. This is a big new push you guys are doing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Does that fit into the sphere of digital or how does that work within Vanguard? But direct, we looked at direct indexing 
years ago we started thinking about of what's a way that you you could disrupt the ETF or or the mutual fund like is there you always should be looking is there a better way to do it and direct indexing existed for a while it was reserved for the ultra ultra high net worth and we could see that hey there's huge tax benefits for a lot of investors in using direct indexing but we started to see customization as people care more about the values of how they invest and could you create portfolios where you're not going to undermine someone's retirement but let them invest according to their values and we got very interested in it and said rather than hope that it goes away or doesn't undermine, why don't we embrace it and see if we can grow it and see if it is a better way to do something. And we'll find out over time. But we'll be, we'll be investing heavily in it. And this is our, our final question. If you could go back to your early days of senior leadership and, and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? It's one I've learned through time. and. Um, it's always ask more questions. Um, fewer statements, more questions. And listen, listen to the answers and encourage the debate. I catch myself still doing it today. Um, I have to do it. Um, and you, you're going to learn so much more if you let that team go. And one thing I've learned, you know, it's, you've always heard you can, like, you may not be the smartest in the room. I grew up with this. You may not be the smartest in the room, Tim, but you can be the hardest working. Mm. And that's, that's how I grew up. And I came to learn something else, which is, um, you know, even if you think you're the smartest in the room, you're never smarter than the whole room. Mm -hmm. So in time, I learned, okay, that, like, we're not going to be smarter than, than the room. How do we bring out the best in that room? How do we get them to collaborate? How do we get them to build knowledge on each other? And you'll, get, you'll produce great things as a team. Wow, that was really quite an hour of fascinating conversation with Tim Buckley, Vanguard's CEO. If you enjoy this conversation, well, feel free to check out any of our previous 500 discussions we've had over the past eight years. You can find that at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. You can follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts on Twitter at podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps us put this conversation together each week. Robert Bragg is our audio engineer. Paris Wald is my producer. Sean Russo is my head of research. Atika Valbron is our project manager. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.